Can an American K-pop group succeed? It was only a matter of time until a K-pop label tried to make this a reality, with one example being America to Korea, a JYP-led reality show to form a female American K-pop group, with the show's lead song proclaiming that his group is ready for the world. and perhaps even reaching mainstream America. The show takes a look at JYP's vision in creating an American K-pop group, where you'll see 90% of contestants perform Itzy's Dala Dala, see a move or reaction multiple times, And hear JYP's critiques after each performance. It's not great. It's not great. You're wasting too much of your air. Your dance is very amateur. It's very amateur. Shows like America to Korea, or A to K for short, has many international K-pop fans excited. The show is a joint collaboration between JYP Entertainment and Republic Records. Republic Records CEO Monty Lipman saw just how successful JYP's Japanese group Niju did in Japan back in 2020. He wanted to replicate that formula, but instead of having Japanese girls, they'd use Western talent to form a group, where the two music labels would visit five U.S. cities, New York, Dallas, Chicago, Atlanta, and Los Angeles to hold editions. K-pop has grown to the point where K-pop labels are seriously thinking of creating their own American K-pop groups, a far cry from even five years ago. For this A to K group, they'll debut first in Korea, but be based in the States. This video will break down if American K-pop can succeed and if a US-based K-pop group can attract Korean fans. While this video will use the A to K group as the main example, this video will also talk about any future American-based K-pop group. JYP and Republic Records are hoping that the A to K group will be a massive hit like Niju, that this group will be embraced by Westerners. And if this happens, expect more K-pop labels to create their own American K-pop groups. A to K is not the first attempt to create a Western K-pop group. For the past several years, there's been attempts to do so. Back in 2022, Hybe and Giffen Records partnered up with UMG with the intent of creating a Western global girl group. The idea was worked on in the background for two years, with the show now being announced as the debut Dream Academy in 2023. The show received a staggering 120,000 applicants for the show and will take place in the US. In 2021, SM Entertainment and MGM wanted to form NCT Hollywood, yet with former MGM chairman Mark Burnett leaving the company, SM's Lee Suman being ousted from his own company, and SM Entertainment's new CEOs halting the NCT system's expansion, this put an end to the SM-led Western group, at least for now. Then there was British female group Kachi in 2020. which originated from a dance cover group and had a Korean in the group. Yet the group was not well received by international fans as their sales, views, and exposure, unfortunately, did not push the group to higher levels as the group lost members every year until they disbanded in 2023 and would rebrand that same year as Ati. Perhaps the most notable and controversial West of K-pop group was EXP Edition, Created by then master's student Bora Kim while studying at Columbia University, her master's thesis back in the mid 2010s wanted to push the boundaries of K pop as she wanted to see if Western talent under a K pop training system would translate well. She would form EXP Edition, a group with a nearly Caucasian cast with one half Japanese member. Kim would send them to Korea to enter the K pop market without an official label training them up. Despite the group trying their best to learn Korean, its culture, and adapt to the K-pop market, the group would soon flame out. Then there's Black Swan, a female group that actually doesn't have any Korean members. 
the members were accepted by Korean label DR Music and from there entered the rigorous K-pop training system as the girls would learn dance, singing, Korean language, and culture to immerse themselves within the industry. The group gained a decent international fan base since rebranding in October 2020 from previous group Rania. Its fans are interested in seeing if a non-Asian group can successfully break in to the K-pop market. Yet one big concern from all these Western and global groups trying to break in into K-pop is that many international fans may not be as welcoming as they say, as many comments from international fans are quite skeptical and dismissive of this trend and at times hostile of the idea, whereas Korean fans in general are at least a bit more receptive or curious. So as excited as international fans say they are, when they watch a show like Ada K and parade themselves as being a Western K-pop group's greatest ally, overseas fans can also be a Western group's greatest enemy as well, as they're a lot more critical, in general, of a Western or American K-pop group than actual Koreans themselves. As exciting as an American K-pop group is for international fans, there are a lot of questions, such as, will Koreans support this new group? Will this group generate new fans in the US and abroad? Or will an American K-pop group be propped up solely by existing Western K-pop fans? Now just as a disclaimer, when talking about the A to K girls, the following critiques and criticisms have nothing to do with them, who are all talented and look to have the drive and determination to make it as K-pop stars. So there's no problem with the girls at all. Rather, the criticisms will be about American K-pop groups in general, why it's so hard for an American K-pop group to succeed, with the first critique being, any US K-pop group will be closely scrutinized for each member's age, where if a female is too young, Westerners will be on high alert. And this is what happened with the A to K trainees, where the average age range for the show is 12 to 16, with a few 17 year olds being accepted. The show is looking for talent born around 2006 to 2010. Now having the age requirements except 12 and 13 year olds is a major problem for a lot of international fans, as the group is planned to debut in later 2023. And this would make those same 12 to 13 year old girls a year older at best and the same age at worst. Now you may be asking, other K-pop groups took girls as trainees that were as young as 12 or 13 years old. That is true, but in these cases, they usually had a three to five year training period, meaning that these girls would debut around 16 to 18 years old. The A to K group's age range is one of the biggest obstacles for many international K-pop fans supporting the group. After all, if there's one thing that the foreign K-pop community is big on, it's protecting minors and with good reason. In Korea, it's a bit more accepted to star younger idols, but in the West, that's a big no-no. Since the foreigners, it's just weird to see younger girls do dances, especially more provocative ones. Even taking out the morality of it, nearly all foreigners prefer older idols as they sell better than early teenage singers. In the US, the average age of a soloist getting a number one album was 29 back in 2019. These days, according to 2022 data, it's increased to 31 to 34 years old. Now, while this data does include both males and females, successful female singers tend to skew a bit older in the West. For example, Ariana Grande would make it big as a singer when she was 20 years old back in 2013. And going even further back to 1999, when 18 year olds Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera were ruling the charts as teen starlets, these two were well past their 12 to 13 year old days. So with that being said, JYP Entertainment and future K-pop labels could be facing some major backlash if they debut American K-pop groups with young idols. Is it really K-pop with Americans singing the song? Many K-netizens say this, but even overseas fans have similar concerns. A big reason why foreign fans like K-pop is because it's from Korea and seeped in Korean culture. K-pop is not defined just from the rigorous training system. It's the members being immersed in speaking Korean, the members knowing Korean culture and mannerisms, and taking part in Korean music shows like Inkigayo and Music Bank. By making an American K-pop group, 
many fans fear that the ATK group, as well as future groups, will become too westernized. Now, continuing with the ADK group, the members will be learning Korean and Korean culture. And there's also two members that's had exposure to Korean language and culture, Gina, who is a JYP trainee, and Kaylee, who's Korean American. Any US-based K-pop group will have a heavy American influence, and that may turn off a lot of fans. Many overseas fans are drawn to K-pop because it's not Western pop. Between the aforementioned Korean culture and language, and then K-pop having some slick choreography, and that female K-pop, in general, is more about innocent topics, such as love, or talking about the guy you like, girl crush concepts, or being confident in chasing your dreams. Can an American audience like K-pop? This is a big question that K-pop has to solve, if K-pop can actually break in to the mainstream. As big as BTS, Blackpink, and TWICE are in the West, K-pop is still a niche in the US. While K-pop fans in the West will support the genre, Outsiders to K-pop will have a much different take. Solo artists are a lot more popular in the US. Singers such as Beyonce, Bruno Mars, Taylor Swift, Doja Cat, and a host of hip-hop singers are all solo. Choreography is a lot less important in America than in Korea, where dancing is a requirement. Outside of One Direction, it's hard for an idol group, recently at least, to thrive in the West where the West did, yes, have their idol phase back in the 90s and 2000s with the aforementioned Backstreet Boys or girl group Spice Girls from Britain, the West has moved on from the idol generation for the past 20 plus years. Asian countries, on the other hand, have a culture of accepting idol groups where fan meetups, frequent music show performances, and updating their lives on social media are the norm. This idol culture is still going strong today, and a big reason for this is the weekly music idol shows like Inky Gayo, Music Bank, The Show, and so on, where fans can be updated on the newest idol groups, see their short interviews, and hear their music, which has the cycle of constantly promoting idols. American shows just don't promote the singers with a ton of fan service the way that Korean shows do. There's also the problem of America having a wider variety of genres, with hip hop and R&B being the most popular at number one, then rock at number two, and then pop representing number three. There's also a robust indie scene in the US, as well as people just liking a lot more different types of music, such as heavy metal, EDM, jazz, funk, and so on. The size of an idol group will also have to be considered, since most popular artists in the US are either soloists or bands with few members. This will also have to be true with K-pop idol groups coming in to America. Any group that's four or maybe five people at max would be ideal. Groups that are larger than five people will most likely not gain much traction in America, since they'll be bombarded with too many members to know, which goes against Americans liking solo members or tighter-knit groups. Other aspects that are found in K-pop that won't fly with Americans are Egil, which will have to be cut out. A music video shown in America will also need a story or narrative, rather than the MV being just a bunch of choreo. Skinship between members, which happens often in K-pop as a sign of being close friends, will be looked at as being weird in the US, as it implies a relationship or invading someone's space. And having a group of just one ethnicity, such as either all Korean or all Asians found in your typical K-pop group, may not appeal to Western audiences as much, as diversity is highly prized in the US. K-pop's infamous training system may also present a huge obstacle as well, where trainees on average will train from two to six years in skills such as singing, acting, English lessons, PR speaking, songwriting, choreography, and knowing camera positions on music shows and concerts. While Western singers also receive training in various skills, it's nowhere near the obsession that idol groups get, since idol groups are expected to be professional and polished from day one. To get to the standard, the K-pop training regimen is quite strict. Freedoms such as having cell phones, posting on social media, and going out at night are prohibited in K-pop. The training system is renowned for taking raw but talented individuals and turning them into a polished group by the time they debut. The training system is often referred to as a K-pop factory since they churn out idol groups at an alarming rate. Yet this very training system flies in the face of Western culture where if a K-pop label told an American group of trainees to give their phones up or banning them from using social media, there may be a riot within the company. 
or telling American trainees to train 10, 12, or 14 hours a day with little to no rest, a lot of the US trainees may complain or walk out, or limiting American trainees to a strict diet of eating just a sweet potato or a couple eggs or vegetables a day, a lot of Americans will complain that the group is too skinny, that they should eat more, and that they're being starved to death. Or expecting American trainees to bow and use honorifics when speaking may be too much, as English itself doesn't have many respectful speech and mannerisms like Asian languages. Or having American trainees have little to no input in songwriting for their first couple years, where writing your songs in American music is more of a rite of passage and more normal. Americans in general hate being controlled to that degree, where the company dictates what you do. They won't like it if an American group is told what to post and what not to post on social media, or having scripted lines word for word to the media. These examples showed a vast difference between Asian and Western culture, being part of a group versus individualism, being disciplined versus having more freedom. Creative freedom is valued a lot more in the US than visuals and concepts. With that being said, going back to the A to K girls, they did show a lot of respect from a Western point of view. They showed a level of eye contact, which in the West shows that you're listening and taking that person seriously. They smiled, but not overly smile. Like in many Korean encounters, where the situation's awkward or there's this weird silence. And then some of the contestants even cut their performance short to not waste a judge's time with extra fluff. And this was seen with Kaylee's performance, where she planned her routine to a T and cut off her performance early. Oh, that's it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can do more, but I want to stop there. Oh, why? Well, why did you want to stop there? Usually at auditions, I only do up to the first chorus. Uh -huh. This is a smart move by Kaylee, since JYP can already judge her talents based on what she showed and to not waste his time. While having tough skin and humbleness are requirements in the K-pop industry, it's not so much in the West. Let's take having tough skin first. In this video, titled JYP Making Yeji and Leah Cry While Recording in a Singing Session, Yeji and Leah being from JYP's other group, ITZY. Choose me. Ah, After watching the video, in my personal opinion, JYP was more than fair in his critiques, giving them brutal honesty, but he wasn't trying to be mean about it. He even told the two to rest after a while, to recharge themselves and cleared her heads. Now to be fair, nearly all of the comments were in defense of JYP, saying things like, you have to strive to be at the top, you have to work hard, that you need tough love for people to improve, that this album was important for ITZY, and that JYP knew it, and he knew that the group had to sing at their best, and that the criticisms from JYP are only gonna help the girls. Yet for all the comments from fans that get it, you get some comments from overzealous fans that say that JYP was out of line, that he didn't have to be mean, that his criticisms weren't useful, and that JYP pretty much needs to handhold Itzy, and that the girls can't sing like JYP himself. After watching the video, I do think that the video's title was written to bait fans into getting mad at JYP. And I do agree with this comment here that says that there's some Western Korea boos that are trying to stir up the pot with the video title. Another example is during A to K itself in episode 7, where JYP dished out some harsh criticism to Kaylee. I can barely feel any emotions. Second, you were ahead of the beat the whole time. Can you try to explain to me what, what happened? I'm not sure. I know I can do better and I knew I could do better and I practiced as much as I could. 
The reason you guys are here is because you guys are special. I saw something special in you. So from now on, it's all about learning. You're 12 years old, Kaylee. As Kaylee broke down in tears, there were many international fans that said that JYP's criticisms were too harsh, that it was too much for a 12 year old, and that JYP needed to tone it down. But I think after watching this video, I think Kaylee wasn't crying at JYP's criticisms per se, that she was hard more on herself, that she could have done a lot better. I think a lot of foreign fans have this mentality of we have to protect the idols at all costs and that any producer or manager, whether it's JYP or another person, have to tippy toe around her idols and can't say anything resembling harsh criticism. Now, some can say that the reason JYP is harsh is that English is not his first language, even though he speaks it like a native. But I think the main reason is that being blunt and straight up are staples in Asian culture. In the K-pop industry, these types of critiques are normal, where JYP was on the nicer side of things. Some other CEOs and managers are on the meaner side. While these mean managers aren't pleasant people, they were not abusive at the same time. And anyone that's participated in competition, such as sports or making it as a music artist, knows that they'll be critiqued. These managers' jobs are to make their idols sing to their fullest potential. I do think that criticism is fair game, as long as it's not malicious, attacking someone personally, and not leaning towards abuse. As an idol, you're expected to take sharp criticisms to fuel you and to improve your performance. Idols need thick skin. Because as much as some fans say that JYP is harsh, fans and netizens will be five times more brutal. But in the West, a lot of trainees may be against this kind of harsh criticism and may take it a lot more personally. Now going on to humbleness, on Niji Project, the Japanese contestants were always humble, downplaying their own accomplishments, often bowing, and always thanking JYP. Contrast this to A to K, the American applicants were more confident and quicker to highlight their strengths. Now to be clear once again, this isn't to say that the A to K contestants were downright boastful or cocky, not at all. The US applicants were quite polite and humble. The American contestants being more confident in highlighting their strengths shows that US culture favors these traits, where being a lot more talkative and showing what you can do right away Whereas in Asian culture, you're expected to say something like, although I danced well, I can always improve and learn more. And you should downplay your accomplishments. Also, humbleness plays an important part if an American group were to expand into Korea. To keep a good image in Korea is to stay humble, even if you're a huge star. Koreans will turn against any star that's too cocky, no matter how big they are or how many day songs they win. Some of the biggest downfalls of idols happened because they were too big-headed and full of themselves, where the Korean public in turn tuned them out. Being boastful and cocky are traits looked down upon in Korea, so a Western K-pop group will have to keep this in mind if they want a foothold in Korea. Now isn't K-pop heavily influenced by America? This is true. I do want to be clear that not everything in K-pop is influenced by America, as they have their own unique genres, such as trot, and ballad, with even K-pop and Korean idol music themselves having their own twist to it. Not to mention, a lot of their pop music is heavily influenced by Japan. But yes, it is true that K-pop heavily pulls from American pop, R&B, and hip-hop. So with that being said, the question is, why would Americans listen to K-pop when they can listen to the source where it came from, US music? And the answer is, Americans may not be interested when there is already a lot of English language artists that sing pop, whether it's the US or Canada, Britain, New Zealand, or Australia to name a few. These countries would probably resonate with the average American since they all speak English and have similar cultures. A lot of the everyday American may not want to listen to songs that are also in a foreign language since they want to understand the song's lyrics without looking up translations. It's much like how some Americans may not want to watch an anime or a foreign movie while reading subtitles, where they instead would prefer an English dub. So did the casual, non-K-pop American. Why go abroad to listen to foreign music they can't even understand when they can get American pop at home? Which leads to the next point, where a US group such as the A to K group could end up in no man's land, where it's possible that this group appeals to no one as they're too Americanized 
to appeal to Koreans or international fans that like K-pop because it's based in Korea and to Koreanized to appeal to the everyday American. So which audience will the A to K group serve? Will they sing all in English, all Korean, or half-half? We'll see if they can attract an American audience and differentiate themselves from the Taylor Swifts and Miley Cyruses of the world. If they can do that, this group may have a niche within the US, but if they can't, they may struggle to gain a foothold in the US and will be stuck in K-pop purgatory. A major question is, if an American K-pop group can stay disciplined and strive to be great. For any idol, not just Western or Korean, they'll be content after their first big hit, since future American K-pop groups will most likely be debuting under a Big Four label since they have both the resources and star power to create such a group, groups such as A to K will have a much higher chance of popping off and doing well. They stand to garner a lot of views, a slew of new attention, and the instant spotlight of being JYP's new group. From an expected sellout debut, can the group stay hungry to do well with their albums after a few weeks, several months, or past one year? when all the hype is gone? For many foreign fans, the overarching question becomes, is an American K-pop group sustainable for the long run? It certainly is possible, especially since K-pop is recognized globally. But for labels that want to create the next big American group, the biggest obstacle will be that if the group can appeal to the average American and get people who's never heard of K-pop before to check it out. American K-pop will need more than one group to pop off to make a splash in the American music industry and to become accepted in mainstream US culture. Let's see if K-pop can pull it off.